Now, quickly before we start, I just have to say thank you all so much for your support throughout the years. We're nearly at 1 million subscribers and we can almost taste it. Right, without further ado, let's get on to the video. These apartment blocks are slowly being reclaimed by nature. It looks like they are the scenes from a post-apocalyptic TV show. Human life here has been interrupted. What was once the home for hundreds of people is now left to ruin. But what is the cause? War? Famine? Or even contamination, maybe? Well, no. Within eyesight, there are plenty of other thriving homes, with more springing up. Our story today goes all the way back to the early 90s, and a tower collapsed that would claim the lives of 48 people. Today, we'll be looking at the Highland Towers collapse. My name is John, and welcome to Plainly Difficult. Background. It is the early 1970s and a new apartment development is being built. It is to be a free 12 storey tower complex. The area is Taman Hillview, Uluklang, Selangor, Malaysia. And I apologise for my pronunciation there. During the period, the town has a larger than average percentage of expatriates in its population. And as such, the developers are aiming the complex to the middle and upper class residents of the area. The name given to the development is Highland Towers. Behind the towers sat a steep, tall hill, which is rather nicely contrasted with the panoramic views of Kuala Lumpur. The groundwork for the three towers involved a cut and fill method, where the area for the building's footings are cut away and held back by strong retaining walls, with the hill behind terraced. This is a common method for building into a hill, but it is vitally reliant on the strength of the wall and the condition of the ground. Part of the clearance of the site involved diverting a local stream via pipework. The buildings had concrete pile foundations sprouting out from the building's support columns. In 1978, the first tower, rather aptly named One, was completed, followed by Towers 2 and 3 in 1980 and 1982 respectively. The drainage on site would turn out to be inadequate, requiring regular maintenance, although this wasn't regularly done, resulting in infrequent flooding. The area, Ulu Klang, was known for landslides, with multiple events occurring in the area during the 1980s. Regardless, it would continue to see development throughout the 1980s, and importantly, even into the early 1990s, when a new development would break ground on the hillside behind the towers. The development was called the Bukit and Tarabangsa Development Project. It was also aimed at the wealthier side of society. This would require the removal of trees and other foliage. And it may surprise you if I told you that this can be a deadly thing. You see the roots of the trees and plants kind of acts like a natural rebar, holding the soil and the like together. If you remove it, the soil can become very susceptible to erosion from rainfall. Just look at the multiple events of railway bank erosions that have happened. Whilst we're on a railway side tangent, let me tell you about this story I found on Ground News. What's that, you may ask? Ground News is a tool that can help cut through the confusing world we live in, where we are subjected to the rapid spread of hard to verify information through social media, echo chambers created by algorithms and filter bubbles, and financially incentivized click generating news pages. Ground News was created by a former NASA engineer and will help guide you through the complex media landscape we found ourselves in. And it does this by gathering related articles from more than 50,000 sources around the globe. This allows you to see how the same story is reported at different outlets and importantly, their political biases. Take a look at this story on a do not travel alert that was issued after a freight train derailed on the West Coast mainline. It has been covered by 16 sources and it has a 62% lean to the left. If you scroll down, you can see every article about this topic 
and compare headlines. This headline from GB News focuses more on the chaos of the situation, whereas this less sensational article from Sky News is a bit more calm and descriptive. I for one find this really useful when researching for videos, as ground news allows me to get a fuller picture of an event. It works for me as an important tool for thinking critically and not just following one side of the political spectrum and taking a more balanced account of events. What I really like is the blind spot feature, which allows you to check for stories that you may not always see due to having strong political biases either way. And if this interests you, and I think you will, go to ground.news slash plainly difficult to give it a try. If you sign up through my link, you'll get 40% off the Vantage plan, which is what I use to get unlimited access to all features. I think Ground News is doing important work, and I hope you'll check them out. Right, now let's get back to the video. Part of the building project, additional pipe work to divert water away, was plumbed into the existing system. Anyways, at some point during the early 1990s, the stream pipework became overloaded due to the additional plumbing and building materials clogging up the waterway, creating a burst causing water to run off along the hill. What no one realised was that the lack of proper drainage and no roots strengthening the soil was creating the scenario of a landslide. In December 1992, water was running off the hill and it was now seeping into the ground, weakening it. The area around Tower Block 1 had also become sodden with water, in doing so, beginning to undermine the building's foundations. But it wouldn't be for another year until disaster would strike. The disaster. It is late November 1993, and a large crack has appeared along the road up to the Highland Towers. Things would get worse by early December, when the area started receiving a prolonged bout of rain. Around this time, the foundations had already been eroded around Tower Number 1. Water was still running down the hillside. Eventually, this undermined the retaining wall behind the towers, and cracks started to appear, followed by its eventual failure. Over 100,000 cubic metres of mud slid down around the sides of Tower Block 1 over the following days. The excessive weight of the mud started cracking the block. Some residents took this as a sign to leave, but sadly not everyone. No efforts to save the building were made, and many of the block's residents just went about their daily business. The foundations of Block 1 were by now only hanging on by a thread, until it couldn't take any more of the horizontal load of the mudside. At around 1.30pm on the 12th of December, Block 1 collapsed, crashing down sideways. The collapse was seen by bystanders and almost immediately calls to emergency services were sent out. Many people attempted to search through the rubble for any survivors. Three people were pulled out from the building in the initial search, and this was around 4.30pm, although one of them would die later on in hospital. Over the following days, international rescue teams helped sift through the rubble. Cranes helped remove large pieces of debris as sniffer dogs sought out any signs of life. 24 Japanese rescue workers painstakingly searched the building. They were using the fairly intact elevator shaft to access all of the crushed levels. During the search, a note was found saying, help, we're still alive. But as reported in the New Sunday Times, no one was found. Over the following week, more and more bodies were pulled from the rubble. Quickly, the death toll was increasing which after the search efforts ceased on the 23rd of December, the number was now at 48. But what of the two remaining towers? Well, authorities quickly evacuated blocks 2 and 3, forbidding any return in fear they would be next, but they did not follow the same path of their collapsed sibling. A subsequent structural investigation would condemn the remaining towers, leaving them victims to crime and vandalism over the coming years. The collapse had garnered worldwide attention, likely due to the numbers of foreign nationals who lived in the area. Of course, the cause had to be found out. This would result in a government committee being formed on the 13th of December 1993. Their first action was to freeze all hillside construction projects. This was at least 44, all of whom would be required to resubmit reports on their project safety investigation. The technical committee looked over the disaster site, reviewed photographs of the collapse, the building's plans and witness statements. 
and it wouldn't be surprising to find out that the landslide had something to do with the collapse. The investigators found that the landslide had occurred over four successive retrogressive slides. The horizontal load of the weight of the mud actually snapped the building's connection to its foundations, causing it to fall over. The history of the poorly sited and maintained pipework came to light. What's more, the addition of extra pipework from the new building site further overloaded the stream drainage. The retaining wall that was meant to hold back the hillside was 2 metres wide at the top, stretching out to 3 metres at its base. But clearly it wasn't enough to hold back the substantially weakened earth from the clearance works further up the hill. But why? Well, it's going to be the standard of cost and corner cutting, and in proper consideration of the development's surroundings. The issues with the towers went all the way back to its first design. Draftsman Wong Ting Sang was found to not have the correct qualifications required to design buildings over two stories. An unqualified architect is never a good start, but what's more, Sang had actually raised concerns over site drainage, and had made plans to increase water displacement. This was ignored by the developer. But later, a court would find that it was still the architect's responsibility to make sure that the building was safe, and if not, report them to the correct authorities. Also in court, the building's engineer came under scrutiny for not properly calculating the loads from horizontal force with enough redundancy. It was also found that the engineer skirted the requirements for adequate drainage. The local authority was found at fault for not enforcing the correct rules. The developer of the Highland Towers was also found at fault due to not hiring a qualified architect, as well as not installing adequate drainage, and on top of that, the whole bullying their contractors out of their obligation to report the corner cutting. On top of all this, the developer of the site above the towers was also found liable due to diverting water into the overloaded pipework, as well as the clearance activities that undermine the ground. Essentially, the court found that each person involved should have made sure the project was properly built, and if not, report it to the relevant authorities, even if it meant being fired. Financially, the disaster would be estimated to have cost more than 60 million Malaysian ringgits. On top of that, hundreds of people had to be rehomed. On the 2nd of June 2004, a lawsuit was settled out of court with Ambank, agreeing to pay 52 million Malaysian ringgits to 139 residents. In return, they would have to relinquish their stake in the property. Interestingly, the remaining towers never collapsed. Instead, due to vandalism and the elements, have turned into creepy relics, acting as a cruel reminder of what happened in December 1993. The land has been condemned for future dwelling development. Instead, ideas of a park have been thrown out. So now it's scale time. It's going to be a 5, and this is what I've got for my bingo card. Do you agree? Let me know below. This is a Plain Difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plain Difficult videos are produced by me, John, in the currently sunny corner of Southern London, UK. I have Instagram, a second YouTube channel, and Twitter, or X, or whatever you want to call it, for all my extra odds and sods and bits and pieces. I'd like to say a very Warm thank you to my Patreon and YouTube members for your financial support and for the rest of you for tuning in every week to my videos. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching and Mr Music, play us out.